rationing. And the screen magazine in its second issue tried to explain the reason. Hello, my name is Dean Kaltover, and this is The History Show. Today we have a gentleman who was in Vietnam from 1969 to 1970. Is that what it was, uh, yes. Richard? Yes, yep. Uh, Richard Watkins was a, a member of the artillery uh, when he went into Vietnam, but he was assigned to an infantry unit. So um, we'll talk about that, and we'll explain to you why he was assigned to an infantry unit. Uh, he's written a book called Vietnam No Regrets, and this is the book. If you could... Uh, <clears throat> zoom in on it. It's one of the best books I read about or read on Vietnam and um, if you can get a hold of it, uh, it's at your local... Well, no, it's, um, it's actually available Amazon. Amazon.com. Amazon. And we have a website com. for you too. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we put VN, the website on. Sure. Vietnam.com, but it, we do, it's not available in any stores. No. It's not available. Okay. So uh, if you could pick it up, believe <coughs> me, uh, it's, a, it's a great read. It's about his time. <coughs> with the infantry unit called uh, uh, the uh, Wolfhounds, the 27th Infantry, 1st Battalion, Alpha Company, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, I did read the book, and uh, to me, uh, uh, pick it up. I know there's a lot of veterans uh, out there watching the show, oh. so uh, please uh, pick up. And we're going to talk about the book, but first of all, we're going to talk about, he grew up in Brockton, Massachusetts. Were you drafted? Originally, yes. He was dra drafted. He, he, would, he was drafted. Uh, I... Uh, I had actually, uh, after high school, I had gone to Chicago to the Democratic National Convention in the summer of 68. Oh, okay. Uh, and that kind of formed my, my leaning left, leaning right thought process mm -hmm. there. It, I lived in Chicago when I got drafted out of Brockton and, and I came home okay. uh, to, to take my physical. How old were you when you got drafted? Uh, I was 19. You were 19. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty old in the Army, uh, in considering <laughs> I'm 19. <laughs> well, you know, uh, I, I, I tell people that because it's, in reality, uh, it's, uh, you have to be that age. You cannot be a heck of a lot older. That's right. I think the oldest uh, soldier I served with in Vietnam was probably 24 uh, because of the, the conditions, mm -hmm. the and weather. And he was considered an old man. Uh, he was... Uh, Consider an old man. Yeah, I mean, you know that we, the terminology we, that they we use had. A, we had a first sergeant who was forty, and I thought he was, uh, you know, going to have a stroke any minute. <laughs> you know, I, uh, and he was very old, and he was forty, and I'm thinking, that's not as old as he used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, did he have an experience in Korea? Was he a Korean War veteran? I don't know. I don't know. Oh. To tell you the truth, I, I assume so because right. he was a uh, he was a a career soldier, right? Uh, and it only made sense that if he did, but I, I never asked him to tell you the truth. I never really had a conversation with him. L uh, l l let me ask you this. Uh, you, you went to basic training. Where did you go to basic training? I went to basic down in uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Fort Jackson. Remember the company that you were with? E82. E82, okay. All right. C31. <laughs> there you go, E82. <laughs> you got to remember that, don't you? Uh, well, I don't know. That sticks with you forever. It's like sticking, uh, you're, you're, you're given a, a number when you go in the service. Mm -hmm. uh, but my military, my number, my IRA number, U.S. number, mm -hmm. whatever it was, was changed to my Social Security number okay, in basic that, training. Okay. Uh, one thing I always like to, uh, to bring up, when I had gone in the service, I was one, I was, I weighed 275. Wow. I came home eight weeks later, I was 170. Wow. So I lost over 100 pounds wow. in eight weeks. So you did the basic training at Tank Hill, ran, the, ran up and down the mountain. There you go. There and you go. and uh, did the basic training. Uh, what do you remember about basic training? Shooting a rifle for the first time? Well, you know, I mean, that, that's there for sure. Uh, I think what I look back on it, uh, where I went in on October 24th, and I came home December 24th, and I requested those dates, by the way. Wow, wow. Uh, so it's like I had originally been drafted, but I went to the draft board and, and talked to the lady who, uh, who ran the show and explained to her that uh, I'd like to go in October 24th. 
and if she had something leaving that day, and she did, so I could be home December 24th. Oh, God. So I could be home Christmas Eve. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but what I remember about basic training the most is just a, a lot of running, uh, obviously. Uh, uh, but the, the, I probably, no one's asked me that ever, I don't think. Probably the, the best thing I remember about basic training is where I was a uh, heavier, was having a sergeant on my arm when I went through the chow line for you know breakfast, lunch, right, and right. dinner, and having him say, no, 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 no. And by the time I get to the end of the line, I had a, a, a carton of milk and a piece of bread. Wow. And that's, I lost 100 pounds in eight weeks, so that just- Well, you know it. what I, I noticed the basic training people at? Added pounds or lost pounds? Uh, they they have the system done yeah. good. Yeah, they, they do. They and, really do. And they have nutritionists too. Yeah. That that set up the meals and so forth. And yeah, I uh, I didn't do a lot of uh, I don't remember a lot of drilling. Mm -hmm. to tell you the truth, I think that was was the. It just seemed like to be a lot of physical physical training. Uh, I don't remember practicing saluting uh, that kind of thing. Obviously, the M16 we 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 shot it and and that that was. Almost like a Star Wars weapon. I mean, it was plastic. Mm -hmm. I, I know. Mean, yeah, it was. It was kind of cool. Yeah, did, yeah. You, did you ever uh, get involved in Vietnam? I knew you were in Vietnam, and uh, with the M16, the hand-to-hand -hand combat. No. Okay. No. Face to face, yes. Hand to hand. Uh, okay. Uh, All right. Because some people did with the M16, and it's not a good weapon to. You know, I, I had I had no problems with the, my M16. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if I was fortunate, or, or but I kept it as clean as I yeah, could. Yeah, you have to. I had a, had a cleaning kit in the stock of it, mm -hmm. which uh, was rare. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, had, I could take it out, I could run the barrel. I had a, to a toothbrush that was always oiled up and, mm -hmm. and kept it as clean as I could. But I knock on wood, I uh, never had a jam, I never had That's a problem survival. At all. That's survival. That's yeah. survival. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, your, your, your weapon is survival. I mean, that, that's... It, it is. and. Uh, uh, what happens in Vietnam, and I don't have to tell you that, is that it is so the, so hot and humid and, and, and so just beat the heck out of you mm -hmm. that you're always going trying to be lighter, lighter, lighter right, at right, all right. times. Uh, so at the end, I, mean, I was, was the weapon. I carried 400 rounds of ammo with me. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys carried 200 rounds. I, I had a fear of running out of ammo. Yeah, same, the, same here. Same. Yeah, I, yeah I so I, I carried a little extra. I, I carried extra. But I stopped carrying hand grenades. I stopped carrying, uh, uh, I had a bayonet, I stopped carrying that. Oh, wow. Uh, I stopped carrying C4 uh, explosive because I just wanted to be lighter. I, during the day, I would have my shots on mm -hmm. with my boots and a t-shirt type mm -hmm. thing. Uh, like I said, we belonged to a recon team, so right. there was only 12 of us. It, you, it was almost like you weren't even in the military, per se. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not, uh, I wouldn't have uh, been very good back in the states. Yeah. I know that's in what the, happens in the military. a lot of people. Yeah, that's what happened. So, what happened after basic training? Where do you go from there? And well, I, I I came home. Yeah. Uh, for Christmas, like I mentioned, and then we went. Uh, I had to go back to basic training to get my orders, and my orders I I had to hang out there for a week or two or whatever, and then mm -hmm. we uh, I went down to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. All right, artillery. Artillery, but. There was two kinds of, I never worked a gun. I never knew how to uh, be a uh, number one fire. man, number two man, yeah, fire, fire the gun, actually. Gun. I was on the combo team, which okay. we laid wire, and I learned, uh, you know, the alpha, bar, uh, the, the terminology of radio, yeah, RTOs. Yeah, alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Charlie Delta, uh, Delta Echo. Echo, all that. There uh, you go, there you go. Uh, what do they call that alphabet? They call it the phenomenon. Phonetic alphabet was that what it was? Maybe oh, so. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't remember. But you, you had to know that terminology. Oh, you had to talk like that. Yeah, exactly. This is, yeah. uh, yeah, it's like, I can remember talking on the radio. I had a call sign. Well, yeah, I was. This is Charlie Delta Echo Bravo, that type of thing. Or my, yeah. my call sign was uh, Delta Tango, two four, something like that. Because but my, it changed. My, mine was like I can remember Vacant College, and I was uh, two six. I think I remember something yeah. like that it was. Yeah. My, oh, yeah, my call sign always changed. I had a, I always had a, an encrypted map with me at all times because we would always call signs would change because the enemy would get a hold of a call sign, right. and then that'd be a problem. That would that would change uh, what at noontime? Is your, is it, had, it seemed to change every, no, not a, not a specific noontime. Oh, okay. Every couple, three, four days would change in call signs. Yeah, I, 
I think yeah. I was, it was at noontime, you know, yeah. it, it switched over. So everybody was in sync. Yeah, it, yeah, it would be like that, but to uh, be honest with you, I don't remember it being uh, specific, specific. Okay. like that. I, uh, so you do combo, how long, how many weeks is that? In, in I was down at Fort, uh, Fort, Fort, Fort Sill for eight weeks. How'd you like uh, Fort Still? Lot in Oklahoma. It was. It was. I remember. It was kind of. It was into January, February, March type thing. Kinda it was. Cool. It was cool. We had some snow, uh, that kind of thing. And um, what I do remember the most about it is that at the end of training, uh, they they mustered uh, 120 of us out on the parade field or whatever, and the sergeant started calling off names. Uh, the following, you know, individuals will be going to Vietnam, et cetera, and he's, boy, he must have called off 100 guys. And then there was down to like 20 of us. And then seven or eight of them were going to Germany. I remember a couple of guys went to Turkey. And then it was down to me. <laughs> me, and I was the last one. I, they signed me to advanced training in uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, for what they used to call a red-eye missile. Right, yeah. Uh, which is a sh- sh- shoulder, shoulder, shoulder held mounted, missile. Yeah. Uh, went down to Fort Bliss for three weeks, did training on that, added to my MOS or whatever, uh, and then I went home from there. I mean, usually Red Eye was basically in Korea and, 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 and Germany. I mean, yeah. How'd you wind yeah. up in Vietnam? Well, what happened from there is that I was uh, assigned to uh, Fort Riley, you know, Kansas. Kansas. And I was assigned to a uh, self-propelled eight-inch gun battery, I guess you would call it. And they had like three guns or whatever. And I was the obligatory red-eye missile guy. But I didn't have a red-eye missile. Yeah. I never saw a red-eye missile. <laughs> you, know? you never fired one. I never fired one. My guys, we had a, a training and, and one yeah. person fired it out of 30 of us. And I was in training with not just privates, but... Mm. Sergeants, there was a couple captains, there was a couple colonels. Oh. They were all doing the training too. Uh, and I was here I was at Fort Riley and uh, one month turned into a one, two, three, five. And I was, I was destined for Fort Riley. I wasn't going anywhere. Wow. Now, I was almost a year into my service and I... Uh, so what rank were you at Fort Riley? Oh, uh, E3, yeah, E3, PFC. PFC, okay, sure. at those days, okay. So, uh, Fort Riley was uh, just a, not a very pleasant place to be. It really honestly mm-hmm, wasn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, we weren't welcome there. We're at the, that's the home of Kansas State University, if, if the you know, viewers don't realize it. Okay. Uh, so we couldn't even go downtown because we were Army. We were, you know. It was it, off limits. Yeah. But, you know, you could, but the, the people downtown, they were all college kids, mm-hmm. and they weren't welcoming you because you were military and they weren't. And, you know, the 60s were like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, make a long story short, I, I went down, I uh, talked to uh, the first sergeant or wherever I had to go, and I volunteered to go to Vietnam. And within weeks, a couple, three weeks later, you know, my name came down on a levy and I was going to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And people I worked with in, in Kansas, were they crazy? And I said, you know, I have to go to Vietnam. I really did. Socially speaking, Mm -hmm. my social circle coming out of Brockton, coming out of a working town, uh, shoe factories, et cetera, everybody I knew, everybody I grew up with went to Vietnam. My brother had gone to Vietnam, came Mm -hmm. home. My best friend went to Vietnam twice. So socially speaking, what was I going to talk about when I came home? How bad Kansas was? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm going to sit around the VFW and mm-hmm. talk about how bad Kansas was. Right. That being said also is that I grew up in Vietnam. Well, I, didn't you grow up in World War II in Korea? I mean, when you were a kid, well, well, I mean, well, that was not, kind of... Well, World War, World War II, II, of course, with veterans, of course, but yeah. in Korea. Right. Not so much with the Korea. I don't know if I ever knew a Korea veteran, to tell huh. you the truth. But, but meaning saying growing up with Vietnam, I mean, it was on TV every night. I mean, everybody really is the Walter Cronkite thing. Right. Uh, so being 18, 17, 19, 20 years old, I wanted to know. I had to know. I had to know if I could do it. I had to know if I mm-hmm. could hack it. I had to know if I could experience it. What would I do? And, uh, and I tell people today, uh, I got to Vietnam. 
after a great trip, we drove cross country. Uh, a buddy of mine, he was going to Vietnam at the same time. When I got to Vietnam, and it was quick. It was like here, 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 bang. Mm -hmm. Standing there in a clearing along the Cambodian border, mm -hmm. thinking, what the hell have you done? <laughs> you know, what have you done? But I mean, you're not the only one that said uh, that. Yeah, I, I volunteered. In the land of Army land, right, you don't volunteer for anything. That's right. And here I volunteered, and I stood in a clearing thinking, this is serious. This is real, real serious. I said, nobody, John Wayne doesn't get out of here. This is serious stuff. Thinking uh, 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 I was going to have to just take one day at a time and work my way through it. And through the grace of the God mm -hmm. we pray to mm -hmm. uh, and be allowed to, to, to live another day. And go from there. Um, I just want to say something. I don't think I've mentioned it on, on this show at all, but I was a volunteer also. Oh, okay. Well, there and, you go. And um, I decided that um, I wanted to experience the, the situation, and if I didn't, I would miss out on that experience possibly I, in my life. Well, you know. So it, that was my thinking. And that was my thinking also. And a lot of people say, what are you, crazy? No. And I'm thinking, you know, I can't imagine sitting here today not having had that experience. I can't imagine not having that in my DNA, mm -hmm. in, my, in my hard drive here. <laughs> I've had that experience. And I say that because I'm, I'm out at different events, you know, signing my book mm -hmm. and, and meeting mm -hmm. a lot of veterans and right. a lot of non-veterans. And I've had more than one guy my age come up to me regretting not having gone. And uh, well, or going more. into the National Guard. Oh, the Guard and, 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 hiding and out not, over there, yeah, you know? Yeah. But I've, I, this gentleman, he sticks with me, and he always will. He came up to me, and he, and it wasn't that he wasn't going to, he was actually avoiding it. This school, that school. Oh, the war's still going on. I got to go now. I got to keep mm -hmm. on going with school, school, school. Mm -hmm. So finally, here we are later, and he's almost tears in his eyes. I had to walk around my table and give him a hug and say, pal, Honestly, let it go. No, really. You know what I tell them? Uh, they say, um, I wish I went to Vietnam. I said, no, you don't. Well, you, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, well, yeah. If you didn't go, no, you don't. Well, there's an old saying, well, you know, wishes are wishes are wishes, right. or whatever that saying is. But, um, well, obviously the title of my book is Vietnam, No Regrets. Right. Uh, and I get that question a lot. You know, why? You know, why, don't, why do you say you have no regrets? And that's a tough question. You to can't answer. look back. I mean, that's, no, that's the experience. I, I would do it. I would do it again, but that's hindsight's fifty-fifty or hundred percent or whatever that says. So I'm getting confused here. Yeah. But not knowing the outcome of it, it would be tough to walk out that door and do it again, because I, uh, I've always been very grateful. I've always been very grateful that I was one of the chosen to be allowed to come home. Mm -hmm. You know, to get back on that plane mm -hmm. that dropped me up there a year earlier, and you get back on and go home and being allowed to uh, to, to to have a life. Uh, it, it was an experience, no no doubt. No, uh, no doubt and, about and it. My uncle yeah. from World War II, who was in Guadalcanal, told me after the war. He said, "I it was a and that's when the million dollars was a lot of money. A million, it was a million dollar experience, but I wouldn't do it for a million dollars again." And I thought he put it in. Yeah, that's in, very well. I, I don't, well, like you said, I, 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 I want people to also know that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just constant, constant, you know, bombs, bullets. No. You know, uh, you know and, and, and blood and gore. And, and, and mm. it, it wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. You had probably 90, and there's a saying, 99% you know, boredom, boredom and one percent sheer terror. Yeah, uh, it may have been a little more. It goes more than from that. boredom to sheer terror in seconds. Yeah, and, and, and people don't realize that. And one of the things about it too is we have a, the the adrenaline in us gets you to a, a high from within, and you, you you want out, but then once that high start, stops coming down, you want back in again, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a paradox. It goes around mm -hmm. and around and. Uh, this is why a lot of guys came home. They ran into a lot of trouble because they couldn't find that high again, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. rather than just Good let point. it go. Yeah. I got a piece of advice from a guy when I first got there, and it served me well. And we all get advice along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, most of it is 
you know, beer talk you yeah. know, advice. Yeah. But this guy said to me, he said, Rich, if you want to survive here, he says, you're going to have to do two things here. One, don't take it personal. Two, don't take it home with you. And I, and I, and I put those two together, and I lived mm -hmm. my year there, and I kept on thinking of what that guy said to me. And I said, you know, I never took it personal. That no, wasn't, that wasn't, yeah, that wasn't a problem. They were doing what they had to do, and you were doing yeah. what you had to do. Yeah. We, yeah. We, were you, when you were in combat, and I, I'm kind of jumping because I'm I, no, not talking about the, how you got there and so forth. Sure. But when, when you were in combat, were you fighting for yourselves, yourselves in the, in the sense that you were with the 27th Wolfhound Alpha Company, or were you fighting for your country? How did you perceive that in your mind? You know, absolutely uh, fighting for myself and the guys next to me. Survival. Straight up. Straight up survival. And boy, let me tell you, unless you've experienced it, you'll be surprised what you will do to take that next breath. Mm -hmm. And I explain to people what that's like within reason. And it's, a, it's a, another a paradox of combat is that when bullets are flying around you, uh, I know that sounds trite to say that, mm -hmm. but you want to move and you don't want to move. And the thinking process is going through your mind. If I move, I bring attention to myself. But if I don't move, maybe someone's already got a beat on me. Mm -hmm. So you're caught in between that, right, that right. paradox. paradox yeah. But I, uh, I never, ever looked at it that I was fighting for the United States of America. And I love the United States, don't get me wrong. I, know, no, I, I never looked at it like that. I never, uh, I, had a, you know, I had a 10 year old girl ask me not long ago, and I don't know where she got it and where it came from. But she said to me, she goes, she raised her hand at an event and she said, do you feel bad about not winning the war? And I looked at her and I said, she said, no one's ever asked me that, not my little girl. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I, I didn't go to Vietnam to win anything. Mm -hmm. I knew, uh, you just knew gut-wise that you're not going to win anything here. And if we did, quote unquote, win, what would we have won? Right. You know, would we really want 100,000 soldiers there occupying Rather. the place right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. like a la Korea? Mm -hmm. No, not really. So in reality, uh, well, that's a, probably another part of the interview. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I get well, windy over get, here. No, that's nothing. I mean, I mean, you, you're getting it. I mean, um, um, I remember reading uh, after uh, the war was over, Lieutenant uh, um, Colonel Summers, who wrote uh, the book on strategy, on on Vietnam, went to North Vietnam and his counterpart. He met him at the airport, and he said yeah. to him, um, uh, "We won every ba battle." And the North Vietnamese colonel said, that's irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, that's irrelevant. And that's also probably the same colonel, uh, General Gap or whatever, yeah. basically said at that Christmas bombing in, in 72 or whatever yeah, right. it was, is that, why'd you guys stop? You had us. Mm -hmm. You know, another 24 hours, we would have been begging for peace, mm -hmm. right? But you stopped. That lies also the politics right. that started with, I, I think the whole thing started when Kennedy got killed and then get into the whole Vietnam thing and it ripples right through to today mm -hmm. when we are in uh, uh, Iraq or, uh, or Syria or whatever mm -hmm. we are mm -hmm. spending uh, a, billions, million billions. a million five <laughs> on, a, on a missile mm -hmm. to take out a Toyota and two, two guys. No. I, I, that, that, that's like, that I, doesn't make any sense. I agree, I agree. I mean, it makes for a well, nice, nice photo op. You know, you see this truck going along, and then, boy, he's gone at a million five. I know. We'll talk about that in another Good. show. Good. I, but I'm, we, we want to get to Vietnam. How'd you get to <laughs> Vietnam? I mean, it was heavy duty. We're almost uh, the show is almost over. Oh. But let's uh, let's talk about uh, from Fort Riley. You volunteered, right? Sure. And what happened? When you got your orders to? Yeah, uh, my my orders came down. How'd you fly over? I, you know, I, I was it Oakland. Yeah, I came out of Oakland, uh, Travis Air Force Base. Yes, yep. uh, I think it was a United Airlines flight. It okay. might have been a Pan Am flight, but All it was right. commercial, All right. which surprised me because I figured you're in the military. You got yeah. military planes, military, yeah. etc. 
but we actually went over with stewardesses and everything and, 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 yeah. and arrived in Vietnam and uh, even coming in, looking out the windows, you knew you were not arriving in the Bahamas. <laughs> you know, for what sure. The palm trees, you mean? <laughs> no palm trees. There was a lot of little holes uh, that are caused by mortars, look like the landscape of the moon, and coming in slow, so slow, slow, and then landing, and having that back door, that plane open up, and having the the heat, the humidity, but more than that, the smell of the yeah, place. I knew you were going to say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I knew you were going to say Ran right that. down the aisle right. at you, and you walked down that aisle, and you took a right, and it being, I was right in front of you, and you walked down, and it was, it was, it was you knew you it, were in for an adventure. It was, it was amazing, that smell. And, but it, once you got there and you stayed there, you didn't smell it anymore. Oh, okay, God, no, 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 yeah. You know, but but, <laughs> but that, that, that initial whiff, whiff it was like. A humidity. <laughs> yeah, because everything that doesn't smell well in that kind of humidity hangs around a lot longer mm. than it does in. Good point. In, you know, in Chelmsford. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, and, and the, what, what struck me a lot about the, the, the countryside and the people, too, is that it, 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 the, the climate, if, if lack of a better way to say it, oh, yeah. aged people quickly. Uh, meaning, if you're 20 in Vietnam, you look 30. If you're 30, you look 50. If you're 50, you looked 150. A lot of a lot of hard work. A lot of hard work. Uh, yeah, very industrious people. Mm -hmm. They are. Uh, they were. Uh, they they meaning meaning they found very numerous numerous ways to kill you, mm -hmm. and you always had to be on your highest highest alert at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, I get that question: What's Vietnam look like? And I, and I'll say, you know, I don't I don't know if I really know what Vietnam looks like. I know what 12 feet in front of me looks like, mm -hmm. walking a trail. Because I'm looking right. for tripwires, right. thinking it's why, why bother the fish line? You can't see fish line, mm -hmm. but it just. I, 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 it's funny that you say that because uh, I, I I look at it this way. I was in Vietnam wearing fatigues. You know, I wasn't in civilian clothes. I think it would be a different picture if I was in civilian clothes. I mean, yeah, it's a whole yeah, yeah. World. And and I think the. You have to remember too is that the overriding thought process, whether you're thinking about it or not, it's always there, and it's taught called survival. Mm -hmm. This isn't a movie. This no. the, people aren't getting up after someone directly yells cut. This is real, and right. it's scary real, and it's 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 heartbreaking real. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people don't realize that the, because of the movie syndrome we live in now in, in the, the the video games right. is that. You know, being shot hurts, and when someone is next to you or down fifty yards away, and they're crying, it, it mm -hmm. hurts. And, uh, they, and they cried for their mother. I, yeah, yeah. Well, who else would you cry for? Yeah, who, I know. Who, who else did you know in your yeah. whole being? Right. Never really questions you mm -hmm. and undying love. I know. It, the person who gave you life. Well, that's correct. You know, you can have a wife, and you can have kids, and you can have a dog. But it, it, the mother is it, and that's that. Mm -hmm. you know? This is the book, um, Vietnam No Regrets. If you could uh, zoom in real quick, maybe we can get that. Uh, uh, next show, I'm going to ask him why he wrote the book. Uh, and uh, It's one of the best books I read on Vietnam, so please pick it up if you can. Uh, he, we have a website for him. The next show, um, you could check out the website. And what is the website? It's uh, www. V, uh, vnvet.com. Vnvet.com. Yeah. So and, um, and Amazon.com has it. Oh, they have the yeah. the audio version, the Kindle version. Oh, good. The hardcover version. Get the Kindle version. It's easier. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen. Thanks for coming on All the right. show. We're going to talk about Vietnam <laughs> and your experiences in the 27th Wolfhounds, uh, uh, 25th Infantry Division. I, so. Uh, I look forward to it. I, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm glad you picked up on the uh, the one two seven because yeah. it's a it's it's, it's a it's, great outfit. It's a story outfit. Yeah.
Green Magazine in its second issue tried to explain the reason. Well, my name is Dean Kotchover, and this is a history show. Today we have a gentleman who was in Vietnam. He wrote a book on Vietnam, and one of the best books I read on Vietnam. It's called Vietnam No Regrets. Richard uh, Watkins from Brockton, thank you for coming. This is uh, the second show. Yeah. We're talking about uh, him going to Vietnam. He was stationed in Fort Jackson, Fort Fort, Bliss, Still. Fort Still, Fort Bliss, Fort Riley, there you go. and then you got orders for Vietnam. The question I have is, why did you write this book? Why did you, why did you write this? Great question. Yeah, thank you. Great, great question. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I, I always ask good uh, questions. So uh, yeah. You know, probably, I, I, I want to say it's a multifaceted answer. I don't mean that. But I guess probably the overriding reason is that uh, I wanted people that were in Vietnam to know that there is a book or there would be a book that would tell it like it really, really was. Mm -hmm. It sure and what, does. And what the think, thought process was. Right. I didn't want to dwell on uh, my, my mission or the missions I went mm -hmm. on. I tried not to dwell on that. What I tried to do is take someone and put them right beside me and give them a sense of being there with me because I tell my story in the narrative. Mm -hmm. So in essence, I've had people come back to me and say, boy, that was like I was right there. Exactly. And so I wanted to write something for the guys who were there, mm -hmm. but more than that, the overriding really reason was I wanted people who know someone who was there, the guy who never talks about it, I want his wife or his daughter or his son to read a book that maybe gives them a better understanding and more of an insight into what Vietnam was really like mm -hmm. for the average soldier. I don't write it like, uh, uh, like I'm a general and I know all the battle tactics <laughs> and that stuff. I really write it from what's right around me and right. what I'm doing and what I'm thinking and feeling. I've had women come back to me now uh, and say, you know, I bought the book for my husband for the first time, after he read it and I read it, for the first time he's talking about it with me. Wow, that's it, interesting. It, it was it, it 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 bridged that gap. Right. Right. For him to be able to say, you know, page twenty three, son of a gun. If I could write, that's what I that's what it was like. That's what I would have said. And if she read it, so now that gap has now been a bond has been brought mm -hmm. there. I've had that said to me over the last five, six years, a dozen times. It's, it, it, was, it was important for me to put that down. You know, I don't know if your next question was gonna be, but when I decided to write it, I sat there, I retired, well, 12 years ago now. And I'm a classic example of someone who retired, who wasn't ready to retire, I had nothing to do. I don't fish, I don't hunt, I don't drink, I don't do a lot of stuff I used to do. Mm -hmm. I sat there and I looked at that picture. I have that picture, and a little 35 millimeter picture on the cover of that book. And the reason I even have the picture is because it was taken with my camera right. by a guy I was with, right. and I had his camera. And I would take pictures of him without him knowing it, and he would take pictures of me without me knowing it. That's mm -hmm. how I even ended up with it. Mm -hmm. Now, I sat there drinking my coffee one morning, talking to my dog. And I said, you know, Midnight, I'm looking at the picture and I'm saying, you wanna, you wanna know about this day? I, I remember that day like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Every bit of it. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, I, I, it was almost a curse. The book flows, short chapters, easy read. Pick it up. Yeah, that was uh, another. If that, you want to understand Vietnam, I, I mean, really. Yeah, uh, that's this, another thing I wanted infantry. to do. I wanted yeah. to write in very short chapters. Mm -hmm. I wanted people to pick it up, put it down, and get right back with it. Uh, we've all read books where the chapter is 100 yeah. pages long. Uh, yeah, exactly. And it's like, oh my God, when's yeah. this going to end? Yeah. 
I wanted to just bang, bang, bang. It's not a big book. It's maybe 300 pages, it's and excellent. it's got 50 chapters. It's excellent. So. All right, let's get back to uh, Vietnam. <laughs> you get into country, um, you get assigned to your, or you get off the plane. We were talking about sure. you getting off the plane and, and the heat, after, uh, getting off the plane, the humidity and the smell in Vietnam. Even though after a while that, that smell... Sure, it dissipates. No, it, yeah, exactly, yeah. that's the word. And so you get assigned to your unit. Tell me what happens you get assigned to. Now, did you know that you were going to the 25th Infantry? No, you didn't no, know. no, no. So you got into country with orders. They were going to assign you to. Right. Didn't matter. Could have been anywhere in Vietnam. It's, you, you go into a, what you used to call a repo depot. Right. Where you are, your autos come down, you're in there with maybe with a barracks situation with a dozen guys or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then they come around the next morning with a manila envelope uh, and your orders, and they hand them to you. And I remember taking the manila envelope and pulling them up like this and seeing the 25th Division patch. And I'd been with the 24th Division, so I knew the 25th. Mm -hmm. I goes, okay, all right, all right. And then I pulled a little further, and I saw Wolfhounds. And I goes, I knew because I had known about the Wolfhounds. Uh, you knew about the Wolfhounds. I, uh, I don't know if the viewership here, but uh, a gentleman named Colonel Hackworth, right. who is uh, one of the most highly decorated soldiers of all time, mm -hmm. he was the commander of the Wolfhounds. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realize also is that Oliver Stone, who made Platoon, right. was what with the great Wolfhounds. Movie. Great movie. Uh, he was with the Wolfhounds right. also. <clears throat> so I, I, I knew that I had a little bit of a problem, but I didn't know how much of a problem until I got the problem. The Wolfhounds uh, uh, were, were a unit. Uh, my, why I know about the Wolfhounds is my uncle was in the Wolfhounds in World War II, and that's the unit he always talked about, the hounds. If you do the research on, on the, the Wolfhounds, believe it or not, they were in Siberia from 1918 to, to 1920 uh, uh, fighting against the Bolsheviks. Uh, so a lot of people don't know that we had an, uh, a Siberian mm -hmm. expedition to right. Russia there you go. Uh, yeah. in, in regards to our history. Yeah. Uh, this and, was, and, and the wolfhound, it is a Russian wolfhound. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, the, it, and that's it's, where they got the name. Yep. Yeah. And the, the, the in, in Latin, is uh, under it is uh, Esperasis, Esperasis, or something like that. But it means no fear on earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Army uh, and the Marines and, uh, are famous for that, coming up with you know, logos and, 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 and wolfhounds and things like <laughs> I'm that. I'm surprised it wasn't a polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> Could have just well have been. Yeah. Wolfhounds is a little, uh, little more so uh, what, what, what they, manly. So would they call you the puppies or the, the hounds or something? I mean, what was the nickname? <laughs> I, yeah, the, probably the hounds. I don't know about the puppies part, but... Uh, <laughs> A lot of people don't realize there was the uh, the one two seven and the two two seven. Okay. It was two different. One, first uh, first yeah. battalion twenty seventh infantry, and the second battalion twenty seventh yeah. infantry. Right. Yeah, exactly. So there was a right. a group, the, and uh, it's a a battalion, and a battalion is has roughly six hundred men mm -hmm. to a battalion. Right. Uh, so you had two battalions, and then you had a rivalry between those, and then you had the in the twenty fifth division a lot of the different little rivalries going on, and that was good for morale. Mm -hmm. That was good uh, yeah. because you had a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. And in the military or in life in general, if you don't have a sense of belonging to something, you're pretty much out there by yourself. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. is why we have organizations you right. know, for that sense of belonging. Right. Uh, it's, it, that's another thing. It's in our DNA, I suppose. Right. So you get assigned to uh, uh, the 27th. You go to A Company of the 27th, the first of the 27th, right? Yeah, they, uh, they, they, I, I took a, a truck up to a place called Coochie Base Camp, which was uh, about 40 miles from the Cambodian border. Mm -hmm. uh, went from there to another small fire support base, which is uh, fire support base Chamberlain, probably about six, 700 guys at that base. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then, uh, First sergeant came over to me and said, you're going out uh, with the Wolfhounds tomorrow morning, get your stuff ready. And I got on a helicopter the next day and they flew me out about 30 miles or so and dropped me in a uh, rice paddy open, uh, clearing. And uh, there was a 12-man, 11-man uh, recon team and I made the 12th guy. 
and that's where I started my my Vietnam uh, adventure, <laughs> lack of a better word. Uh, but I, the, the guy who got dropped off there, uh, so scared that I was sweating from every pore of my, my being, mm -hmm. to the guy that came back in to that fire support base six weeks later was a different guy. It, it had changed me a lot, my whole oh, thinking process. I see. Uh, and, and looking back on it, it was probably a good way to do it rather than piecemeal it, meaning uh, one day out, day in, day out. Right. We, we went out, we stayed out. You stayed out. So in other words, you slept in the, in, in, in under the trees and under the Never, stars. in my whole year there, I never slept in a bed. Never slept in a bed, never slept in a tent? No. no. So you were outdoors all the time. Did it get uh, cold at all? No, not really, not at all. No? I don't remember it being cold at all. You know, uh, damp, yes. Night, yeah, right. uh, a lot of uh, fog would come in and uh, settle on the rice paddies uh, mm. in the early morning. Right. Clammy, but not cold. Uh, tell me about sanitation and water. Sanitation and the and, water? And water, and water. Oh. Where, how do you drink water? I mean, you needed water I mean, to survive. Water is life, <laughs> we all know that, you know? I mean, well, we had, I guess. How many, many canteens did you carry? Uh, depending on how long, between four and eight. Four yeah, That's, most, mostly it's heavy. I had to balance it. I uh, it had to be four on this side, four on that side, and I had them towards the back so I couldn't quite get them. Guy was with would hand me my canteen. I'd drink from it and then hook it back up. Plastic canteen? Oh yeah. Oh, I hated that. Oh, I would give anything from metal canteen. Yeah, I agree. The water was oh. always uh, always warm. Uh, we had to put iodine tablets in the water. Uh, in the canteen, which gave it an awful taste. Uh, that was uh, that wasn't for malaria, but that was just for in parasites, I guess. I don't know what the iodine was all about, mm -hmm. but we had to do it. Uh, malaria pills we took once a week. I remember uh, we would get water out of a well uh, in little villages we'd go through, uh, or they would fly us out water in these big, huge. Bladders. Yeah, it wasn't water bottles. Oh, God, no. It was a big bladder of water. Mm -hmm. The helicopter would come and drop it. Uh, usually that's when we would change our uniforms, too. Uh, I never had a uniform with my name on it. I never had a... Uh, uniform with your rank on it? No. 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 We, uh, w how we would change up is that you would wear the same shirt, pants, or whatever uh, for a week, 10 days, something like that, and then they would fly out clean uniforms, mm -hmm. not new ones, old clean uniforms. Mm -hmm. What did you do with the old ones? You would just take them off right on the Bury spot, them. throw them over in the pile, mm -hmm. then take them back. Oh. And then you would wear those uniforms. You, know, you just go and pick out whatever, whatever fits you and put it on. How many combat boots did you wear? Uh, I was actually, uh, yeah, good question. I was on my third. Third. Yeah. Jungle one, boots, right? Not the jungle boots, boots, yeah. yeah. Uh, first one kind of wore out, the second one, uh, the heel, uh, somehow broke off. I had it. the problem too. Yeah, so I, I was on my third when I when I left. I had the same problem. But it broke in the back. I always tried not to wear my helmet if I could because the helmet is uh, heavy, it's cumbersome, mm -hmm. and I don't know how much really good it did anyway. Uh, so we had uh, we used to call boon caps, boonie oh, cap. caps, yeah. And I had the same one for a whole year. Absolutely loved it. Looked great in it. I mean, I I loved it. Broken in. Oh, broken in. It was starting to wear at the top. I was starting to get a little hole in it. Uh, my last day in Vietnam, I'm, the plane is right there. I'm, I got it. I got it with me. I put it down for a reason. I came back. It was gone. Someone stole it. Someone stole it. Wow. Uh, I you know, I, your whole life. I I believe me. That was. So so did you carry? Did you carry your helmet with you? Oh yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. you carried it with. Did yeah. you uh, take uh, baths out of your helmet and shave out of your helmet? I always yeah. shaved out of my helmet. Sure did. Uh, the bathing, uh, we would uh, uh, we would take uh, five or six guys at a time could fit in a bomb crater full of water. The okay. B fifty two bomb crater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, or, or a stream. Mm -hmm. I would always keep my boots on in the stream because I don't know what's under my feet. My feet were so important to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you'd come out of the stream and you would have a leech here and a leech there. Uh, but as long as the water was running, mm -hmm. 
it was flowing. Right. Uh, it, it, in fact, I have a few pictures of me in a stream, shaving type thing. Uh, always shaved? No oh yeah. beards? Yeah. Always shaved? Yeah, always shaved. It, only because I, I, I'm, I feel cleaner shaved. Yeah. Yeah, and that's just my nature. Right. Some guys uh, wouldn't shave for three or four days type thing. Right. Uh, so the uh, sanitation in regards to go to the bathroom anywhere? Any, yeah, anywhere, it was... Uh, Toilet paper? Yeah, they would, uh, they would, that'd be in the C rations okay. that we would have. C rations were given to us in a box, right. 12 meals to a box. We would pick out what we wanted. What did you like? Uh, peaches and pound cake. I love that pound cake. Peaches and pound cake. I lived the whole year on I, it. I never, I never had pound cake. I, uh, that wasn't my thing, but I love the pound cake. Well, one of the reasons why, if you, if you can vision, is it, the, it comes in cans. So you had peaches, pound cake, a uh, little bit of cheese and crackers type thing. Yeah, uh, Anything chocolate. that's light. Right. Uh, always the light. Always thinking weight all the time. My pack was weighing 80, 85 pounds all the time. Yeah, you were RTO, right? I began, I began my tours on RTL, yeah. I did, which uh, is... Radio telephone operator, that's what we used to call it. I know you call it ra ra radio transmission operator. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, it, yeah, it I don't... It doesn't matter if it was RTO. But, Explains what RTO does and, and how there, uh, there's a bullseye on the back of the uh, RTO. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I got assigned to the recon team, the reason why I did is because the RTO, uh, which is... a uh, Radio, radio transmission operator or yeah. whatever, radio telephone with, operator. With, with a range of 10 miles. At, yeah, and at it max. it's about this big. And it weighs big. about 25 pounds, and yeah. you got to carry an extra battery with it. And the reason why I even had it on my back is because the RTO before me had been hit. Uh, what people don't realize is that I have an antenna sticking off my back that is Visible. Uh, uh, it, it's 12 feet high, mm -hmm. or it, we have a smaller one, it's about four feet or a little less. And in a firefight, when the enemy wants to engage you, it's the RTO they go for first because mm -hmm. I have the communications. That's right. You call in the helicopters. You call I'm calling the, the artillery. artillery, I'm calling the helicopters. Yeah. I, yeah, I got it all on my right. back. And so they want to take me out first. I, I think I read somewhere or someone mentioned it that. Uh, the actual time an RTO has to live once a, an ambush has you know, been uh, yeah. uh, been started, uh, executed is uh, 10 seconds, 12 seconds, it's something like long. that. Very quick. I mean, yeah. and the re and, and also what what what's, what surprised me, but it also uh, doesn't surprise me now, is that when a first shot is fired, everybody who's close to you, the RTO. Get away from you, <laughs> and that was that was a little concerning. Hot potato. The very first time that happened, I, I, I didn't hit the ground fast enough. I, uh, I, I was I was confused, and uh, and then when everyone broke away from me, it dawned on me. And we're only talking seconds now. Right, we're not right. talking a long time. Mm -hmm. I got right down on my knees, and after the first couple, three or four firefights, I figured, you know, I got to do something about this. This is like a magnet. I got a bullet magnet on my mm -hmm. back here. Mm -hmm. And what I did, I found one of those long extension cords that everybody used to have in their kitchens for their phones. And I hooked that onto the, the, the back of the, uh, the, the, the radio that I carried. And when the first shot was fired, I got that right off. And I put it over there. Right. And I dragged it over here and I could talk over here. The radio was over there. I see. Taking the fire. That I believe they can that see the me. antenna. They saw the antenna and they can welcome to it because it's not on my back anymore. Now, there were two types of antennas, if I remember. There was the whip antenna. Yeah. And what was the other one? Uh, it, it's kind of a it, smaller one, a little, it yeah, had to be a little thicker. Yeah, you could bend it. Yeah, I yeah, could bend it. it. I could walk through the jungle through, like yeah, this bent. Uh, the radius of that, uh, of that radio was uh, uh, roughly 10 miles. But if you're in the valley or something like that, mm. it's not... Mm. The range is not that good. Yeah, not at all. We, uh, we seem to always be working within 10 miles-ish of a place called Nui Badin, mm -hmm. uh, which was the only mountain in the area, and that had a relay station on the top of it. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that extended our, yeah. our, uh, our range. Uh, I never once had a problem where I picked up that phone and I couldn't get somebody on it. Mm -hmm. 
we were always within range of at least one of two or five yeah. five split bases. Yeah, a relay station is something that's set up to, to relay your message. It's like a cell tower with a cell yeah. phone, and it bounces yeah. from relay station to relay station. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. It was yeah. like yeah. a primitive uh, yeah. cell tower. Yeah. Can you imagine that? You carried a radio like that, and I carried a radio like that, and and now they have little cell phones that you know. Uh, it's uh, uh, technology is technology. Yeah. Believe me, uh, uh, I have a quote unquote smartphone outside, and it's like that. Not only is it my phone, but it's really my computer too. Yeah. yeah. And to yeah. think uh, what I have in my hand for mm -hmm. power and technology is is more than what sent the men to the moon. Right. Yeah. You know, you'd have a room yeah. this big full of computers yeah. that take the place of this. Right. I, I agree. Where it's, do we go from there? It's a great. I don't know where we go. So, from there. so you get down to to Alpha Company. You're yep. a new green guy huh. uh, in in there, and 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 how do they treat you initially? Oh, you yeah. were the radio guy, so you were really well, important uh, to them. They. Uh, One of the, how many radios did you carry when you went out on patrol? And, you know, I would have one, uh, and also uh, there would be another RTO also okay. uh, that was strictly uh, with the captain, with the infantry RTO. Okay. Uh, I oh, would be assigned to an artillery RTO. Okay. Right, so there's actually two of us All right. uh, out of 12. So explain uh, wh your attack. How, uh, I, I read in the book you were attacked, you're calling in, what do you, what do, you do when, when you get the artillery to fire? I mean, which, wh well, which yeah, there was two ways of, of, of doing it. Uh, originally when I was the RTO, uh, I had a lieutenant with me, and he would, I would have the radio, and he right. would be actually talking on the radio, and okay. he was very good. Okay. Is very good under fire. I did not get along with him outside uh, of, of the actual mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said also is that uh, when I became the, the recon sergeant, then we would split up, all right? I'd still have the radio, right? But then he may be over here, the lieutenant, and he may be with the captain with his radio, uh, so we'd be able to split up if we could. Yeah. Now, when you call artillery in, uh, you know, you would call a fire support base, say, Alpha Bravo 1-2, this is Alpha Bravo 2-0 or whatever. Uh, so I have a call sign and they know who I am. Right. And I know who they are. Now, did the lieutenant have the same call sign? No, he'd have a different, different call sign. Call sign. All right. Yeah. It was all... Uh, all set up before. Yeah, it's all been set up before. In fact, uh, one of the things we did at night on an ambush is that... Uh, uh, we would already call in uh, firing points. Okay. Uh, we'd have six firing points around us. We'd already call that in. I see. To save us. In other words, I, I don't want to call and bring up the battery. Give me, you know, give me uh, fire on yeah. one, two, three, four by one, two, three, four. A so grid. you had a coordinates exactly where you wanted. Exactly. And, 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 um, uh, and I remember we would set up coordinates, but they would be... Uh, uh, it would be like fruit. They would have orange would be this coordinates and oh, apple okay. would well, be this yeah. coordinates. Yeah, and, we and would we would set up as one, two, three, oh, four, five, okay. six. I you see. know, give me uh, give me H E on on six. Right. You know, fire for effect. Uh, or we would what's H E? High explosive. High explosive. Yeah, high explosive, and that's 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 what you want. Right. Uh, but at the same time, they had different rounds we could use. Uh, a what, Willie what different rounds can you use? I mean, well, we'd have a Willie Peter round yeah, that would come white in. White phosphorus. With, yeah, white phosphorus. In reality, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, that would kill you too. Yeah. But it really was for a marker so I could see where the bombs are. I see. And then I could walk them. You I know, see. drop 50, left 50, right, right 50. And back in the battery, they could adjust so I could actually move the bombs around coming in. Right. Uh, which was very important, but then we we would call in uh, uh, geez, uh, uh, like a fragmentation round that would burst above say, ground, above uh, uh, twenty feet up. Yeah, throw out six hand grenades, and then they would all burst down, and that would wipe out like almost like a half a football field. And of course, you get at the beehive rounds, which I saw go off a couple nights. Oh no, uh, kidding! You would not want to uh, be on the other end of those. No, because usually that's when the uh, battery is attacked. Yeah, oh, very much so. Themselves. We got we got enemy the coming beehive, over yeah. over the over the berm at us. Yeah. Uh, the beehive round. If, if viewers don't realize it, it's almost like taking a a, a, a cannon, lack of a better way to say it, it's an artillery piece with a hole on a barrel this big, and make it into a shotgun. 
as you would find what you used to call flechettes. Flechettes, yep, I know what flechettes are. The, and they would go downrange and they would right. wipe everything out. It's the, it's the most devastating thing you ever saw. And, uh, I, I, You're I, not going to survive that. Nothing would survive that. No. Uh, I, uh, uh, to have the Viet Cong attack a, a, a battery like that and, and go up against that, I, uh, they got to be, nobody sober does that. <laughs> <laughs> they really don't. I, I can't imagine that we, uh, we had six, six guns on that, that, that uh, uh, five support base, and they went, three of them turned around like this, had three go right down at the same time. And it just, not only did it wipe everything down range, but it took out half the, uh, the, the, the berm oh, oh. Uh, in front of us oh, okay. uh, because we couldn't get, you had sandbags piled this way, right. and these guys went down like this. Right. So when it went like that, it took off the whole top too. Wow. And went down range like that. A lot that. of working. And it, went, and it spread. And it was the most, uh, we went down afterwards and picked those little darts up. Mm -hmm. you know, the flechettes yeah, were the little yeah. darts. Yeah. Yeah. Were they plastic or were they metal? Metal. I think they. I think in the, in, they would use a plastic in some. Uh, areas. yeah, these were metal because you can't see plastic uh, hmm. in, in X-rays. You know. Ah, uh, yeah. No, we had. We had. I had a dozen of them on my on my hat. Um, what, uh, what's monitoring radio traffic? What, what's that mean? What's Mo what? Monitor, monitoring the radio. Well, yeah, really, it's it's just really listening in and what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it was. Uh, it was. When you are, have a radio and you are, you are where we were outside along the <coughs> Cambodian border, we really, uh, we weren't out there as a force. We were out there more for, to gather information uh, in, in a stealthy manner if we could. Okay. Uh, most of the time, the radio, and I, and I saw some of the radio lights, it had a squawk box on it, like this. Yeah, I, I I never saw one like that. It's the only one I ever saw. You mean the square box? Yeah. That, the, on the radio that yeah. hangs up there. Yeah. I know. I saw some units with that. Yeah, and I, I'm thinking most of the time we yeah. would have our, my radio would be off, off most of the time, or it'd be on so so silently, so 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 I'd have my ear right up to it, you know, to hear it. Or you would hear yeah. through the radio click, click, click it. Click. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we did a lot of uh, a lot of less talking and more clicking sometimes. Uh, the clicking was f for what? Well, if you would have a uh, someone on the fire support base, if we'd oh. call in for some some mm -hmm. fire support, and the the captain or the lieutenant who was ever in charge would want to know what were how how to put this uh, how close the enemy was to us. Are they within a hundred yards? Click once. Within two hundred yards, click two three times. Right. If they're right on you, right, click three times. You know, it, it, depending yeah. on what he wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the handset would have a little clicker click on it, right, yeah. because you'd have to click it click to talk. It to talk, I know. There you go. But not all of us carried a radio, so <laughs> I bet you some people out here didn't carry radio. No, I mean no. It's it's just one of those things that you know the the, the, the clicking the clicking sound is is just you don't want to speak sometimes because the enemy's so close. There you go. So you there use you go. The, the handset to. Um, to communicate. To communicate. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and it wouldn't make a noise on your side. You wouldn't, you wouldn't hear the click. If you we were real close no. to it, you could hear, I mean, real. Yeah, yeah, no. The yeah. clicker would be on the other, the other side. side. Yeah, but it, it was, yeah. was good. Uh, we only have a minute to go, and I've got a lot more questions. Can you come back? Uh -huh. We could talk about gunships and. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd love, love to. I, 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 I see your list there. You know, yeah. This has been such great conversation. I'd yeah. love to come back. Okay, cool. Good. Yeah, yeah. definitely. We'll have you back. Um, if you uh, Vietnam No Regrets, the book, um, I don't know if you can get a hold of it, but uh, I just well, you can always. It's a good book. And, it's, it's available, like I said, on Amazon.com. We've made it into the Kindle version, and what's very interesting is selling very well is the audio version. No kidding. Yeah, we, I had a, uh, uh, an actor from Hollywood read the book, uh, and it's available audio also. And, oh, I, and I interviewed about it. Boy, I bet you interviewed 50 guys. To, to read it. Oh, you interviewed them? I interviewed them, yeah. yeah. Wow. You yeah. know, I mean, there, there are a lot of people out there whose parents uh, were Vietnam veterans, and now they're of age, and they have families, and they might be interested in... Well, it's, it, yeah, it's, it, it's one of those things that, because if, if I hear it once, I've heard it a hundred times, is that, you know, my uncle, my father, or my uncle, you know, they don't speak of their, their, their Vietnam experience. Right, 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 right. You know, and I, I say to people, uh, do this. Ask your father or ask your uncle 
not what he did, but what it felt like to do it. Okay. That'll open up the door. All right. This is a history show. Today we have a gentleman. His name is Richard Watkins. He wrote the book on Vietnam, No Regrets. Uh, he's here. This is the third show we're doing with him. So uh, welcome aboard again. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this time we're going to talk about Vietnam. We started talking about his experiences of Vietnam. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, what he did in Vietnam as an infantryman, uh, how it went, uh, the incursion in Cambodia at one time. Uh, he, he, was, he was an RTO, which means radio telephone operator, but it became a sniper because somebody went on R&R &R and uh, he took that over uh, for a while. We'll talk about uh, being a sniper uh, and what that means uh, to a unit and, and their duties. So basically, um, Richard, welcome back again. Um, you were in Vietnam and uh, we were talking about Vietnam, we are talking about operations. Uh, tell, tell us about an ambush. Uh, I want to get to a lot of things. So, uh, tell tell us how an ambush is set up, or uh, and what happens in the ambush. And it's it's at nighttime. Yeah, usually, I, uh, right. Right. I, I I try to explain to people also is that uh, Vietnam seems to be a a, a two fold situation for us you know, on a recon unit. Mm -hmm. We would. We would search for the enemy during the day and we would ambush at night. And we would ambush every night. Every night? Every night. Out in the mosquitoes, the uh, animals, the snakes. Did you uh, come across any tigers? No, no okay. not at all. Not at yeah, all. Some yeah. people did. Yeah, you know, I, I like to think if you can picture or your, 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 your viewership can picture Vietnam really west of Saigon along the Cambodian border was really, a, it was just a Dead, dead jungle. I mean, that being said, that anything, any mammal per se, had already left town. Well, we were fighting out there every day. The only things that were left out there are your snakes, are your scorpions, some lizards maybe, but anything bigger than that, the monkeys had gone, tigers had long gone. I don't know if there was elephants there, but they were long gone. Yeah. Um, there were elephants, I know, at one time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah, I never, Vietnam, I always thought was gonna be a jungle. And really it's not a jungle as much as it is the thickest, thickest woods you ever were in. Mm -hmm. uh, I expected, you know, Tarzan type jungle. You know, mm -hmm. birds, you know, and, and, and monkeys, you know, swinging up yeah, the yeah, trees yeah. and everything. But in reality, uh, those, those people, those animals had left town a long time ago. <laughs> We were in a, what they call a free fire zone. That meant anything that moved, we would shoot. Uh, I know that sounds un-American, if that's the word, uh, but reality, that's, that was the reality. Uh, so at night, when you would set up an ambush, and ambushes were always set up along trails, if we could find a trail, uh, where trails intersected. Uh, we tried to get into a, what you call a classic L-shaped ambush, where you can shoot, shoot, so you're not shooting each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we would try to set it up like this, so when the enemy would come down the trail, we'd be able to decide whether or not to engage them or not. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that every, everybody that came down the trail we'd engage because uh, we were in a well-known infiltration route. Enemy were coming out of Cambodia, heading towards Saigon. Uh, our, really our job was to get information to find out who's coming by, who's coming out of the border, and to let the fire support bases down range from us know what's coming their way uh, on so occasion. So you wouldn't take a big unit on? Oh, God, no. no. Uh, uh, if there was a thousand guys coming through, you would just let them go through? If, if there was a hundred guys coming through. Oh. 
I laid there one night, I remember when I first got in country and started counting, and stopped counting at 100 going by us. And uh, for the viewership to, to realize that these, they weren't walking by us and I was looking at them from 100 yards away, I was looking at them from 10 feet away. Wow. And that is, is, is that's a lot of pucker power, as the way as the <laughs> saying used to be. Uh, it, it, it's, it, uh, I, I explain in the book, and I'm sure you, you when you read the book, the very first mm -hmm. ambush uh, was, was, uh, has stayed with me. And I don't want to say it was memorable, but it has still stayed within me. Right. Is that they weren't enemy, they were just civilians that were out beyond curfew. Uh, like I said, we're in a free fire zone. Yeah. That means dusk to dawn, nothing moves. And that includes us. If we were to blow an ambush on some an enemy group of soldiers, we in turn would have to move. That would be the most dangerous part for us. Right. Because we got other At ambushes. Nighttime. We got a lot of ambushes around us. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to let them know that we're moving. And more than once we would crawl off 50, 100 yards out to set up a new ambush. So we wouldn't get ambushed by our own men. Right. No. Did that ever happen to your unit? Not that I know of. Okay. Not that I know All of. Right. Uh, friendly fire. Well, friendly fire is friendly fire, oh, yeah. no doubt about it. I, yeah. uh, uh, I actually, uh, uh, not that I know of. Yeah. When, when you were, uh, let's say, when you were in the ambush and, and, and you guys, uh, uh, KIA uh, uh, the Viet Cong. Uh, what did you do with the bodies if you had bodies? You know, that, you know that's that's a great great question because it's a question that never ever comes up. Uh, I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Well, because uh, maybe because I was in Vietnam and that's uh, I probably <laughs> know <knows> the answer. <laughs> uh, we would a couple different things. Uh, and I mentioned it in the book also towards the end of my tour, where there was four or five, we would just pull them off to the side of the trail and just stack them there. Uh, another time, a bulldozer had come in with the engineers and we had buried them per se. Uh, so he would dig, the blade would dig a yeah, hole and, yeah. and then and then he put the dirt over them, so they were buried. Yeah, uh, so they were yeah. in the ground. Yeah. Uh, Another time, we had stacked, yeah, I hate to use that word, stacked up, but we had put some bodies together out far enough, and the enemy came during the night and took them away. And we knew that, and we wanted that to happen. Oh, and wow. I mentioned that in the book also. Right. So there, was, there were different ways to handle it, but to be honest with you, uh, the one that sticks with me the most is just literally uh, putting them off to the side of the trail after we came up upon, wasn't an ambush, we, we kind of like bumped into them. It happens. Yeah, it was like a pay, it was a payroll team too, I remember. Mm. Uh, but we had bumped into them and there was three of them and we, we just left them there and walked on. And I looked back on them saying, but it was the only way we could do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you took every incident and, and put it in your pocket. It would slow you down. Well, what are you gonna do? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know. Did you, did you have any POWs? Did you capture any? You know, I have a couple, two or three. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest with you, I don't know what happened to them. Uh, this was another one out uh, in the Iron Triangle, uh, west of Saigon. Uh, we had captured a, 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 a gentleman. It, it looked like his wife or his girlfriend. Or they could have been VC. They could have been anybody. Yeah. Farmers, probably all I know. But a helicopter came in, we put them on the helicopter and they left and we never saw them right. again. Uh, when, when you have enemy bodies, what do you do? I mean, you search them, you take their weapons? Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and and that's those three that I'm talking about, there was uh, one had a, a pistol, which is a... Yeah, you mentioned that in the book. Yeah, yeah. that was a, that that was a good I story. I wanted that one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah and, and, and a couple of them. One had an SKS, which was... Uh, we could have sent that home one head an AK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we carried them along with us. And uh, some of the guys who would go through their pockets looking for any kind of uh, identification. You know, to be honest with you, where I was... Uh, documentation? Yeah, documentation. That was on, a big thing, wasn't it? Yeah, that it was, was a big... It seemed like a big deal to the guys back uh, yeah. 
uh, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, controlling the war, we'll oh. say. But to us, it really, really wasn't. But we had to do it anyway. Uh, we actually dug up some bodies one day because we were told to. Uh, I, 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 I didn't do it, to be honest with you. I had, a, I had a way of being able to be. Uh, you were RTO. Yeah, I was. A, I was. A, yeah. If I could step back from it, I did. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was. Uh, it was very. Uh, <sighs> did you did you call in illumination at all? Uh, Not really. Uh, no. The the only illumination that you know, you know, I I, I don't think our unit ever called illumination. Wow, that's interesting. I don't think we ever did. I can't remember. I know I never did. Did you carry hand flares? Yeah, we carried the, 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 those those. There were silver tubes, yeah, yeah, tubes around this yeah. big, yeah. where you would break it off and then you would hit it. Hit it right. And you wish you hadn't because it would hurt. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, and, and they would be. Or you the, hit it off your leg. <laughs> yeah, that would yeah. be. Or hit off something hard, but yeah. then it would be like, well, it would it would take your head off too if you if you if you yeah. did get it right. Yeah. Uh, and that would have elimination with a with a little parachute right. that would go around us, but to actually call elimination in, I don't I remember doing that. I see. Yeah. I see. Now, when you were on a patrol, did any of you guys carry mortars or anything? No. No. No mortars. No mortars no. in the whole no. company. No. Well, I don't know about the company. Yeah. Uh, back because uh, half the guys would be back. We'd have a motor, uh, a mortar squad mm. platoon or whatever mm. back at a fire support base, but never a mortar outside uh, the wire. I see. Uh, I know early on they did, uh, but by by '69 when I was there, mm -hmm. we were uh, we were under such an umbrella of artillery at all times it wasn't called for. I see. Uh, uh, um, what rank uh, were you when you got to Vietnam? PFC. Uh, yeah, PFC. Okay, yeah. you got promoted to uh, yeah, E4. Corporal E4. Yeah, almost immediately. Yeah. And, yeah. and then you got promoted to sergeant. In yeah, my last month. Yeah, last month. Six weeks um, or so. Tell me the time about the sniper story. It's in the book, but I mean, uh, <laughs> which uh, which when, one? When what's his name went on the R and R and he <laughs> took over the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had, we had a sniper. His, his kid's name was Bowers, and he went on R and R, and I saw that as an opportunity to not carry the radio anymore. The radio was a heavy thing to carry. Yeah, it was. So I, I merely jumped on, you know, the, the sniper weapon that Bowers had, which was a, which was a, an M14, with a silencer, right? Which M14, is a very, right. very rare weapon. Yeah. But it came with the, what do we call a night scope, a starlight oh, scope. Oh, scope. And was the only starlight scope we had. No kidding. And I always thought that if I was going to be out on ambush, then I'm going to be able to at least see. Why? Why only one starlight scope? I don't understand they, that. Well, I, th number one, they were bulky, they were heavy, but I understand they were very expensive too. Very so. expensive. So, uh, you know, I mean, we're talking five thousand. That's first generation too. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And the other side of it too is that it's a, like the last thing that you want to see uh, in enemy hands. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a good know, point. Type thing. And good this point. was, it was almost uh, I won't say experimental, but it was first first generation. Yeah. This yeah. was big. Yeah, it, and was it was big. It was about this It was this secret. Thing. Yeah, it was yeah. big secret. So uh, it was the only one that it I ever saw, yeah. and it fit on the weapon, right? So and you mounted on top, on top. Of yeah, the mounted on top of the weapon, so you could sit up with it, and you had your crossbars like this, and which I used to make out of twigs off the trees. I'd break up branches and make them and tie them and make it myself, so I wouldn't have to carry one around with me, mm -hmm. and I could sit up with it, but. The the thing is that the jungle we were working in was so thick and so uh, un, uh, unsightline friendly. So so you call it triple canopy basically. Yeah. A lot of triple oh, canopy. Yeah. Triple canopy for people who don't know is that you cannot see the sky, you cannot see the sun when you look and, up. And helicopters can't come in. And, and helicopters and, can't and come in either, either, which is our lifeline. Yeah. Uh, but the the triple canopy means the trees would grow over and over and mm -hmm. over, so you can't see. Right. But that being said, also, I didn't have a sightline on the ground either. So after a while the, uh, of carrying you know, the weapon, and I carried my M16 too. Mm -hmm. You don't realize that. So when we were going into Cambodia, I, uh, I was so grateful to see Bowers come back. <laughs> uh, it was a heavy weapon. Uh, it wasn't like, 
didn't have the sight line to really get off some good shots with it, to tell you the mm -hmm. truth. So I was glad to see so, it go. So you didn't, you didn't really use it, more or less? I, mean, I, no, I, 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 I didn't use it picking off uh, people 1,000 yards out. Yeah. Yeah, they just, uh, the targets of opportunity, they, and they just okay. weren't there. Uh, tell me about the Bob Hope show. How did that come <laughs> out? How did you get uh, to see the Bob Hope? I, I saw Bob Hope. It was the day after Christmas, but uh, I, you know, it was the day, what day? Yeah, we were out about, uh, you know, maybe three or four clicks, maybe a couple miles out of the base, the big, huge base camp. And a uh, helicopter came in and then said, look at half the uh, company, and we were company size now. Oh, okay. We had gone back into the company, so there was like maybe uh, 120 of us. Right. Well, half of it's got to stay out here. We need protection out here. But half can go in <laughs> to see the Bob Hope show. And for some reason, I get picked to go in. Uh, I didn't do anything special. Get on there. They just sent some helicopters out, dropped us in behind it. Bob Hope show was right there. It was so far away. It was like you're sitting in the nosebleed seats here. <laughs> and I said, you know, that's kind of cool. I, I can see him. I know. I, but I want what's over in the PX, the store, more. <laughs> I went over there for a burger and a shake, and no kidding. Right. Uh, I picked up some, you know, toothpaste and toothbrushes and, and, and candy bars, and I brought them all back to the guys I worked with out in the field. So I didn't really, I just sat and watched the Bob Hope show. No kidding. Oh, all right. Well, I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I do just, have pictures of Bob Hope show um, in the book. Tell me about the invasion of Cambodia. Ah, ah. That's. I'm glad you brought that, that up. That was in the book too. We were at a place. W east of Saigon, a place called Bearcat. Uh, we'd been down there working that area for a, a month or whatever, and then this whole thing started coming down about invading Cambodia. This is late April. Of and what year? Uh, of 70. Of 70. And we're hearing 70. about it, yeah. you know, kind of a scuttlebutt type yeah, thing. Yeah. Well, sure enough, word came down that we were going to be going in there, and uh, this is when the, recent, when the whole Kent State thing came down. This is, this is what mm -hmm. brought this on. Well, when Kent State was happening here, we were flying into Cambodia there. Uh, when uh, the choppers came in and picked us up to bring us in, we were outside a place called Tain Inn, and we were literally, everybody making out their last wills and everything because we're, they're going to fly us in and sit us right on top of the NVA's 9th Regiment, which was about 10 miles deep into Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't going to be a pleasant day for us, and there's no doubt about Did it. Did you have doubts? About surviving? Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I, in fact, in reality, to a man, I don't think any of us thought we were going to walk away from that one. This was going into the enemy's base camp. Right. This isn't walking. This isn't ambushing somebody. No. Uh, and sure enough, when they, they flew us in, the helicopters I was, in, I was on was taking 51 caliber hits. It was, it was shaking it up pretty good by the time we got on the ground. Uh, Hard LZ? You know, yes and no, because I, uh, there were snipers around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as it worked, That's just to delay you. Yeah, and, and as it worked out, um, uh, the enemy, gratefully, had moved back 14, 15 miles into Cambodia. We were only going in 11 miles. Nixon had already said we're only going in 11 miles. Why do they give that stuff yeah. away? So, I, I don't get it. No, and they're still you doing know? it today. And what we're, what we're not going to do, what we are yeah, going to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But we're not going to put boots on the ground and all yeah, that so stuff. Yeah, so when we, we came don't in. give that stuff away. Yeah, the infrastructure of the enemy was there. We Tons and tons of weapons and, and rice and uh, noodles and that kind of stuff. That was their camp. Mm. It's uh, making me hungry. <laughs> well, what was, what was best about it is case after case of unopened... Thompson submachine guns. No kidding. Yeah, that was the best. It, it's still in the boxes, still in the wooden Where the crates. heck did they get them from? They came out of, they had to come out of World War II. Two. Oh, no yeah. kidding. They had to come out of World War II, still in the boxes with the... Uh, uh, the Oil and all that stuff on them? Or? They had that, that, that brown wax kind of paper oh. to it. I think yeah. there was six of them to a box. They had the, uh, the clips were about this long, 45 ammo. Uh, and we were Heavy shooting. weapon. Ah, I was, those weapons today are, are worth 30 grand. No kidding. Yeah, they're big money for that weapon today. Uh, no kidding. Yeah, we shot them up pretty good that day and uh, kind of had a, some fun with them. So what, when you got into the, the base camp tunnels? 
No, this is this is uh, the tunnels were back in uh, Coochie. Oh, there were no tunnels there. This was all just open, thick jungle hospitals. Uh, yeah, they had their hospitals there, but nothing was underground. No kidding. No, the tunnels were back in Coochie, which was right yeah. back on our side. But oh, so they they were right out in the open. So they had movie theaters and all that stuff out the out. In, uh, in the, the room. about the movie theaters, but they had the, the the row and row of wooden benches type thing. Yeah, where people could present stuff to them or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but a Kinda lot break of down a AK-47. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So did, what did you do with the weapons and the food? I mean, uh, You know, we were in the, the thickest, thickest jungle you can imagine. We couldn't fly them out. So what we did, we got a hold of some, uh, some locals, Cambodian locals, that had the carts and the, and the uh, those, uh, those animals. What do you call those animals? Oxen. Yeah, like oxen. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, in turn, load them up, and we actually paid them to pull that stuff out, and then helicopters came in and flew it out. You know, so it, it ended up being a three or four days of back-breaking work to get that stuff out of there. So uh, are you expecting an attack? I mean, all the time, all the, sure. Oh, yeah, all the time we would. And so finally, how long were you in Cambodia for? You know, almost six weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah, we get in within the, the May 9th, we left June 26th. Now, do you know that uh, a lot of things happened in the States because of the, that incursion we, yeah, we, afterwards. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, and even, even we knew that was going on or whatever, but to be honest yeah. with you, uh, it was all about survival. We had to survive. You know, yeah. I had to survive. Otherwise, I wasn't going yeah. home. I, 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 nobody I was with, kid, one lick about what was going on back in the States. Uh, Not one bit. Uh, in the first show, you said that uh, survival, uh, that your your it's survival and fighting for yourselves rather than fighting for your country. And that's really yeah. what it was. It, it was yeah. very personal, like that. And, and and the army does that on purpose anyway. Mm -hmm. They put you into small platoons, and then people are doing squads, and they make you be in that position of that if if. Uh, if it's not said, it's, it goes unsaid. If you know darn well that I'm not watching out for you, you're not watching out for me. I, I would do anything to help you get home because I know you would do that for me. Mm -hmm. And the ironic thing about it is that some guys became close, some guys not so close. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a nickname. Uh, I, I served with guys, I, I don't even know their names. They yeah, were, I yeah. know. Is that something? Yeah, the nicknames. Yeah. They, I, mean, I had a nickname. They called me Boston. I had an accent. The, <laughs> the guy from Seattle or Dallas or I, I, I hung with a guy or from... Or Indian. Yeah, everyone you know. had a nickname. And I think that was a, a coping mechanism because you didn't want to get too close, per se. Uh, I could be with you, Dean, for the whole year. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to know much about your home. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, you're you married, you got three little kids. Yeah. That's nice, but... Well, you have a girlfriend back home and you get a Dear John letter. Oh, you get a Dear John letter, yeah. which I, I did. What happened? It's in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, uh, that was an experience in itself, and it, was, it wasn't what... You weren't the only one that got a Dear oh, John letter. It wasn't saying. what I... It wasn't the Dear John letter. It was where I got it. Oh, where, where did yeah, you Yeah, it was where I got it because I was, I was isolated. I, I couldn't call. I couldn't talk her out of it. Mm. I couldn't uh, mm. call or whatever. I was in the middle of a jungle clearing and I couldn't do anything about it. Right. And right. I couldn't run. I couldn't do anything. Uh, that was a tough, tough, uh, tough uh, yeah, situation. People don't realize that regards yeah. to uh, what deal John Lennon's uh, oh, do to some people. I, I had to turn it around. I had to say, look, I'm, I'm going to make it out of here just to confront this person and ask her why. Mm -hmm. Why would he do that? Mm -hmm. You know, and I it's did, life, uh, and it's in the book at the yeah, end of the epilogue of the book. I'm not going to tell you what happens at yeah. the end of the book. <laughs> I won't tell you what the book. It's Vietnam No Regrets. Make sure you buy it. It's one of the best books on Vietnam that I bought. Uh, <clears throat> tell me about uh, uh, C-130 gunships. What's, uh, did they help you out? In, in yeah, uh, yeah, on more than one occasion. It's, it's, it's ironic. It's the first time that I, I saw one in action, per se. Yeah. Is it they're up about, oh, I don't know, maybe two, 3,000 feet? And when going in the circle, yeah, and they're going around you. Yeah. So you would think the the bullets coming out of it would there were red traces, and it's like every fifth bullet's a red one. So you get a stream of red coming down. You would think it would just go, 
straight right into the ground. Mm -hmm. But because of the planes going around, the bullets go around like this. Yeah. And it's the eerie sight. Yeah. Because yeah. they're coming around like this. But let me tell you, when, when they're working around you, it, they're, they're godsend. Oh, no yeah. doubt. I ran into a guy not long ago that uh, flew B-52s. And out along the Cambodian border, they would carpet yeah. bomb yeah. with their B-52s. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, you know, you can just fool. I said, you know, you guys kind of kept us up at night, you know? <laughs> and, he, uh, and I said, how'd you know where we were down there anyway? He says, I don't know where you were. I don't know where you were. No kidding. And I looked at him and I said, you know, he's dropping 500 pounders, 1,000 pounders within a, a mile or two of me. No, I know. From 35,000 feet. And when the ground shakes? Yeah. And you don't know where I am? No. Well, I've heard some units, they get the phone, the phone call and, and they, they say, move out of, out of your position because B-52. Ma yeah, maybe so. But yeah. where we were along that border, that we stretched yeah. out in ambush, 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 uh, gratefully nothing dropped it because we used to go swimming in those holes come rainy season. Wow. Uh, and, and Mosquito I, infested? Uh, it didn't matter. I, uh, it was a way to cool off, anything right. to cool yeah, off. that's true. We did a lot of flying. Mm. I did a lot of uh, combat assaults by helicopter. Yeah. And every time we would get up in the air, it'd be cool us off a Speaking little bit. Speaking of that, you got four air medals, right? Uh, four air medals, yeah. 20 yeah. assaults, one air medal, is that it? 25. 25. Yeah, 25, yeah, 25 assaults so. for one air medal. Uh, we worked a lot with the Navy also on the swift boats. Uh -huh. They'd run us up and down the rivers, which was always a good time because uh, the Navy had a... Every night they'd have the beer and the barbecue and the, uh, <laughs> you know, and the dancing girls, you know, so. Yeah, we didn't uh, talk about the dancing girls at all, <laughs> uh, about no. your time in Vietnam, I mean, Saigon or anything like that. Yeah, I spent, I wanted to be in Saigon. I wanted to see Saigon. I got a chance to do it one day. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we were, two guys I was with and myself, we were pretty much out of place. Uh, and it's the eeriest feeling, if you look back on it, um, 20, I just turned 21. Three and guys got, with M16s over their shoulders walking around Saigon and no one has weapons. Yeah. And thinking, there's something wrong here. Because yeah. in reality, I guess in the, in the hotels or whatever, a lot, a lot of uh, captains and majors. Yeah. And, yeah, we're just army guys, you know. And uh, we went upstairs to the bar upstairs at the Rex Hotel and, and enjoyed ourselves. Where'd you go on R&R, &R, by the way? I went to Thailand. Thailand, yeah. and then you went to another R&R, and you, and you, uh, you went to visit a buddy of mine uh, up in uh, uh, Da Nang, Nang area. Uh, I tried my best to get to Australia, uh, and I couldn't do it. Uh, priority was uh, I got what they call an in-country leave, uh, actually right. an out-of-country leave. I had four days, right, right. and I couldn't be in-country. I could go out of country. I couldn't get out of country. I had to be so. Uh, it was getting. Getting towards the end of my, my time old. in the Army. So you get out of the infantry company and you go back into base camp for what, three months? No, less, less, less probably, uh, probably about six weeks. Six weeks and that's yeah. it, and then you fly home? Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and get home in the middle of the night. It was a classic example of you go into a, a huge building, you know, uh, Oakland Army Base. You literally, uh, you sign this and sign that and sign this. I don't know. And mm -hmm. I don't know if I got any shots, I don't think, at the time. But within 20 hours or so, uh, you were out of there. I'm walking out the door, and uh, there's a cab right there waiting for you. Three of us get in the cab, go to uh, the base in uh, Oakland Army, Air Force, Oakland. Travis? Well, coming out of Travis, we end up going to San Francisco International or whatever. Oh, yeah, San Francisco uh, International. I get uh, some. I went and bought jeans and a shirt or whatever because I hadn't worn any civilian clothes. I got on a plane back to Boston. Uh, but before I got off the plane to Boston, I, I went in the, uh, the laboratory, put on my uniform. Uh, uh, it took my civilian clothes, put them in the bag. Because I knew getting off the plane that uh, my relatives and my mother, father, brothers, mm -hmm. uh, aunts, uncles were waiting for me. Yeah. And I knew they wanted to see yeah. uh, a soldier. You know, coming home. Right. Because uh, they told the, the family and the friends and everybody. Right. I mean, uh, and I knew that's what they wanted. It was, I wanted to be in my jeans and shirt again, don't get me wrong, but uh, it was important for that. And when I got off the plane, I remember looking at that door saying, that's the door of the rest of my life right there. I was so grateful. Yeah. I was no so doubt. grateful to be allowed to come home. Stop. Read the book. Good. 
Vietnam no regrets. He has no regrets. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it very much. All right. right. The book is great. Uh, Appreciate the hot questions. Like I said, one of the best books I read on Vietnam. I mean, I'm I'm serious when I tell you that. That's a a compliment. It was very fun.